and unmute yourself when when I get you um, when I give you a call to go ahead and speak. So welcome everybody. This is uh, Tuesday, May fifth, and we are picking up our conversation on housing transition from um, getting homeless to almost eighteen hundred Vermonters who needed a place to stay as of the beginning of the emergency period. They've been housed in different ways across the state, mostly in hotel rooms. Um, but we are trying to wrap our heads around what the transition might be for moving these folks and their families, these households, as they were termed last week, uh, into um, different housing once the emergency period is over. Um, I don't think that we want to invite people to just join, go out onto the streets unless they want to, absolutely, but I think we need to be working on on moving folks from uh, temporary housing to something that's more permanent. And so that's what this kind of session will be about, is just to get an update on some of the federal information and how it translates locally, and we'll get that from Earhart. Um, and as a follow-up to S-333 and as a conversation about the rental issues, whether it's rental assistance or rental arrearages. We asked Jean Murray from Vermont Legal Aid to join us. And we have Patrick Gallagher from Pathways, which is one of the several different organizations who use a housing first type model. We've heard from Pathways earlier this year, and we will hear from him uh, today to hear where they are um, in the crisis and how they're working and what they're looking to do and what, and what opportunities may be ahead of us. So with that, um, I think we will get right to it. So Earhart, um, if you would like to unmute yourself, welcome to housing Gen um, General Housing and Military Affairs. And um, if you could just, like I said, start by giving us a, a breakdown on some of the work that you've been doing in terms of monitoring the funding that's available and um, what your thoughts on are how we can use some of the $1.25 billion, et cetera. Um, that would be great. Well, uh, thank you, Representative Stevens. Um, how uh, how's my voice coming across? I, I I've had some difficulties with my uh, with the audio on my laptop, so I just wanted to check in and see if it's coming out. Uh, I'm coming across okay. You, I think if you could turn your volume down a little bit, and um, I'm going to turn mine down. You're coming out a little. You're coming out. Um, I mean, I don't know how I sound, but you're coming out like an AM radio a little bit. It's a little tinny. Um, that's too low. Okay. Um, That's I, good. Right. Maybe down. I'll just try to. I'll just try to stay a little further away from the from the laptop because um, I do have a booming voice, as I think some of you know. So don't want to. Yeah. Overwhelm. So if it gets too distorted, we'll let you know. But right now, okay. um, we can understand you. Okay. Great. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for the opportunity, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's an interesting conversation a few moments ago about the. Uh, F-35s, my, my house is uh, probably the first in, in line um, here uh, when they when they come across and it's it's thunderous. Um, so for the record, uh, my name is Erhard Matka. I'm representing the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition this morning. Uh, I want to start off by thanking you all uh, for all of your good work on the uh, on S-333, the eviction and foreclosure moratorium bill, um, which has been our highest priority. And obviously, huge shout out to uh, also to Jean. Uh, and folks at Vermont Legal Aid and, and Angela uh, Zykowski at the Apartment Owners Association, everyone who's worked on this. Uh, as you may know, uh, it passed uh, the Senate this morning, final uh, final passage, and uh, it's hopefully on its way to the governor's desk uh, fairly soon. Um, so congratulations and, and, and thank you uh, for your good work. Uh, I also wanted to give out a uh, huge shout out to uh, AHS, uh, to Commissioner Schatz, uh, his team at DCF, especially Sarah Phillips at uh, OEO, who has just uh, done amazing, they've all done amazing work uh, standing up uh, the response for homeless uh, and vulnerable Vermonters uh, to the pandemic. Um, uh, also, obviously, our housing and homeless service providers uh, and our community action agencies, all of uh, whom are on the uh, front lines. Uh, ourselves, we've been blessed to receive a uh, kind of unexpected $100,000 grant from our National Income Housing Coalition, which we uh, got last week and quickly turned around and made many grants to uh, 20 of our homeless shelters uh, and to the five cap agencies uh, 
and uh, and pathways uh, around the state to help with uh, in a small way with their response to uh, to COVID nineteen. Um, so uh, I, I will say I've been on uh, countless hours of uh, national calls over the last few weeks and have heard what other states uh, are doing. Uh, and I have to say, um, knowing what we have done in the state of Vermont through uh, our housing and homeless network in uh, partnership with uh, state government and with, uh, with you all, um, is uh, it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, it's not uh, we're not exceptional because uh, there are other states that have uh, responded incredibly well to uh, this emergency for their homeless and vulnerable Vermonters, but there are other states that have not responded well at all, and it just makes me really proud to to be a Vermonter and, and see what uh, you know government uh, true government leadership uh, can do in cooperation with uh, the nonprofit sector and with uh, with communities and, and, and volunteers. Um, so while the last six weeks have uh, brought a huge sea change uh, to all of our lives and, and really to the entire world, uh, I just want to start off by reminding you that the solutions to homelessness and our affordable housing problems uh, essentially remain the same and are now more important than ever. Uh, it is, as I think you've heard me say before, it's not rocket science. Um, we need, uh, continue to need affordable housing rental assistance and supportive services, the proverbial three legs of the three-legged stool of housing investments for low-income homeless and uh, Vermonters and, and uh, other vulnerable Vermonters. Um, what the pandemic has shown is just uh, how deficient uh, our system has been uh, all along. And it, it just really underlines that. Um, so I just want to ground you all back in you know, the solutions that we've been talking about for years. They're, they're all still there and they're all still needed just now through the filter of this extraordinary circumstance. Um, even uh, before the stay safe at home order came, uh, the system was completely overstressed and unsustainable. Shelters were always full. Shelter stays were long. The last couple of years, we've had the longest average shelter stays over 50, uh, over 50 days. Um, sometimes for some shelter guests, uh, it could be nine months, it could be over a year, uh, simply because there are not uh, enough subsidies. Uh, there's uh, for folks who are very low income, uh, there is not enough affordable housing for people to move to uh, and not enough supportive services uh, for those that need them to, uh, to succeed. Um, just want to take the opportunity to remind you uh, about the roadmap to end homelessness, which was commissioned by the General Assembly and paid for in large part by the General Assembly five years ago. Uh, it showed us the numbers and the investments that we need to make. And I, I know you know this, but I, I think it's just really important to remind um, that you know in these extraordinary circumstances, uh, the recommendations of that roadmap are still very valid, very viable, and unfortunately, we just lack the political will to raise um, the resources that was needed. Uh, we could have, uh, by now, uh, if we had been able to follow the recommendations of the roadmap, uh, we could have come close to ending homelessness uh, in Vermont uh, by, by now. Um, so in, the, in this unprecedented time, we find ourselves in a unique position. Uh, over the course of several weeks, we've taken virtually the entire state's homeless population, half again, as many people as were counted in last year's point in time count, and we've helped them get into housing. Um, we've effectively, at least temporarily, ended homelessness um, in the state of Vermont. And I think that's something that uh, we really need to celebrate um, as, uh, as, as a state. Um, we clearly don't wanna, as uh, you've said, uh, Chair Stevens, we don't wanna waste this opportunity to have these folks forced back into concrete shelters. Uh, cars, uh, encampments, and living on the streets when the governor's emergency ends on May 15th. Uh, we were really happy to hear uh, when Commissioner Schatz uh, announced and uh, they sent out uh, uh, official notice uh, that uh, folks will not be turned out of motels uh, when the governor's emergency ends on May 15th. And we're looking forward to hearing more details uh, on how DCF proposes uh, to um, engineer the, the uh, transition. Uh, physical distancing is clearly going to be with us uh, for some time, and economic hardship is going to last for many Vermonters for many, many months. Uh, so now is a time where we really need to build a better system that's going to take us into a better post-COVID world for our state's most vulnerable and most marginalized people. Um, if there's one thing I want to convey to you, it's a sense of urgency 
to lay claim to a substantial portion of the federal CARES Act relief dollars for housing and for homelessness. Um, as you know, the state is facing enormous revenue shortfalls for next fiscal year. Uh, Tom Cavett just reported uh, his uh, most recent estimate of $430 million over the general fund, education fund, and uh, transportation fund uh, last week to uh, your appropriations committee. Um, and even though federal funding can't be used to fill holes, uh, federal fund, excuse me, even though the coronavirus relief funds, the 1.25 billion cannot be used um, to fill holes in the state's existing budget, there is gonna be huge pressure on that flexible source of federal funding uh, from all directions. Um, so I, please claim as large an amount of this funding as you can for housing and for, for homelessness. Uh, we just kind of quickly review and give you know, review sort of the big picture of what the CARES Act. Um, uh, there's three tranches. Uh, there's categorical funding, some of which you've heard me talk about, you've heard others talk about, uh, that includes funding that's directed for very specific purposes like community development block grants, emergency solution grants, uh, funding for public housing, uh, Section 8, um, rental assistance, uh, et cetera. Uh, the second tranche is the coronavirus relief funds. Um, which are you know, very flexible. Uh, and there's three basic requirements. Um, one, uh, that the money must be spent uh, between March 1 and December 31. Um, so it kind of needs to be looked at as, uh, as, as one-time funding. Um, it has to be spent on COVID-19 related expenses and it can't be used to fill holes in uh, a state budget that was passed before March 27th. Uh, Above and beyond that, it has very, there's not a lot of guidance uh, from Treasury on this. Um, there is a guidance document that uh, includes, uh, shows what sorts of things the money can be spent on. There are very few prohibitions other than uh, the three that I've mentioned. Um, the third tranche is FEMA funding, um, which requires 25% state match, uh, can also be used uh, very flexi fairly flexibly. Um, and with approval, uh, this is important, can be used to pay for the motel stays, which would help uh, preserve some of the emergency shelter grant funding uh, for some of the other expenses that our shelters and that the state have realized uh, as a result of housing 1,600 folks um, for the last seven weeks in, uh, in motels. Um, so as you probably know, the Joint Fiscal Committee, uh, as of yesterday, uh, has approved acceptance of the coronavirus relief funds. And that um, has been divvied up into uh, sort of three, uh, three kind of uh, buckets. Um, the first bucket is uh, $75 million, which is uh, to be spent by the administration without uh, further prior approval um, from uh, Joint Fiscal or through uh, Appropriations Committees. Uh, on COVID-19 related expenditures on health, safety, and other emergency response needs. Um, and most of that incidentally has uh, already been spent uh, by the executive branch addressing um, the emergency. Uh, the next bucket is $150 million uh, to be spent subject uh, to joint fiscal approval uh, for time sensitive critical needs that can't wait for the appropriations process. Um, the remainder uh, 1 billion, uh, 25 million is gonna be subject to the normal appropriations process. Um, I was monitoring budget adjustment proposal uh, yesterday. It doesn't look like uh, the administration's coming in and proposing uh, that one point zero two five billion uh, be spent through budget adjustment. It's unclear exactly how they're, uh, what process they're planning to um, uh, uh, to to, to uh, propose that through. Uh, but as you can see, with uh, two hundred twenty five. Uh, million dollars of the 1.25 uh, billion uh, already in effect uh, authorized to be uh, expended. Um, this money is going to go fast. Um, you're going to uh, receive a proposal from the Senate for uh, central worker um, uh, uh, grant program uh, that's scheduled as proposed by the Senate to spend another $60 million. So this money is going to go very, very fast. I'm sure you're aware of uh, proposals to spend some of the coronavirus relief funds that I am not uh, not yet aware of myself. Um, so 
Uh, I just want to point out, uh, I'm not going to go over it in detail, uh, but I sent uh, Ron a uh, document that should be on your webpage. Uh, it was uh, put together by the Corporation for Supportive Housing, and I found it to be very, very useful uh, guidance on uh, what some of uh, the funding, so federal funding sources that I've mentioned, uh, what they can be um, spent on. Uh, these are the same folks, by the way, that put together the roadmap uh, to end homelessness. Uh, and it's uh, it's probably one of the more useful matrices I've seen of eligible uses uh, for FEMA, uh, the Emergency Solutions Grants, Community Development Block Grants, and the Coronavirus Relief Funds, um, as well as guidance on how to maximize uh, those different programs uh, for housing and, and homeless response. Hey, uh, I'm not going to go... Earhart, hold on a second. I just, um, Representative Triano had his hand up. I just want to see where he is um, yep. before we head into uh, the next the next section here. Um, Representative Triano. So, uh, yeah, when we, when we uh, thank you, uh, Tom, or uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks for coming today, uh, Earhart. It's always uh, good to hear all the information that you have for us, very valuable. Um, I a couple of questions. One is, when we talk about services being the third leg of the three-legged stool, um, do those services include, for instance, um, uh, folks with uh, who are unable to work because of mental health issues and referral to Social Security for some sort of income? I mean, we know that many people have no income, which is one of the biggest challenges that I guess that we face. So, you know, I'm thinking in terms of, um, you know, uh, these services being provided, uh, which should include uh, referrals to uh, places where they may be able to obtain some income. Is, does that happen at this point? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that is that would be part of the array of services that, you know, uh, folks like Pathways, uh, for instance, uh, will provide and, and, you know, Pat can tell you more about that more about that later um but yeah uh ab absolutely whether it's uh you know pathways whether it's a homeless service uh, provider uh or uh, a designated mental health agency uh or um or or, or caps um you know these are these are the kinds of things uh you know especially for someone with no income uh, who may not yet have qualified for ssi uh but has a clear disability uh, you know, one of the main things, and the state did have a program through economic services and DCF uh, at one point um, to help. Uh, I think it was a, a, a contract with, uh, uh, might have been with Weber uh, or Voc Rehab, I can't remember which, uh, to get folks who um, had severe mental health disabilities and did not yet receive federal SSI. Because uh, that's a, as I think you know, a very complicated process. It takes one or two tries sometimes to get approval. It can take over, well over a year. Um, so there was actually a program at one point to get folks on, on federal disability to make sure that they had at least that minimal level uh, uh, of income. But yeah, when I refer to supportive services, their wraparound services, their case management, their specialized services, uh, in some instances, you know, it could be job training, it could be budgeting skills. Uh, it, it's a variety of services. I, mean, I knew I knew about those services like, as to how to uh, integrate back into a community and uh and uh, be able to uh, maintain a residence. Uh, but, you know, yeah. um, I, I used to practice social security law and um, it, you're right, it can take a year to get through the process. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's sometimes quite arduous, especially with mental health cases I found. Um, so uh, that's a good answer. Now, uh, the other piece that I, that I wanted to ask is, um, hotels are going to open up for business at some point. Um, and, uh, you know, so, I guess what we're looking for, at least I'm looking for, is some th sort of, as you suggested, that uh, DCF might have to come up with some sort of plan as to mm -hmm. where, where people are going to go, um, either right after or in the interim. Well, um, my recollection is that um, the governor's uh, order uh, doesn't, uh, does allow uh, hotels and motels to book people after June 15th. Um, so there is a little bit of a, a, a potential transition um, period there uh, of about a month. And again, uh, as I said, uh, we're looking forward to seeing what DCS plan is. Uh, you did hear from, um, and I'll refer to it again in a moment or two, but you heard from Chris Donnelly, uh, Champlain Housing Trust, the um, pretty comprehensive plan that uh, CHT and Housing Vermont have put together on behalf of 
the um, nonprofit affordable housing network uh, to help, uh, you know, in fairly short order, move uh, move folks. And, and you know, Pat's going to talk about Pathways' uh, ability to help with that effort um, as well uh, when 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 you get to them. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Thank for you. Now? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I, again, I don't want to go over the uh, corporation supportive housing's uh, detailed matrix. I leave it to you, you know, for for your your reading pleasure. But you know, suffice it to say that um, these uh, the this variety of funds um, can pay for a broad uh, array of needed uh, expenditures now, including um, rental assistance, which you know we started talking about on uh, March 12th and March 13th before you all. Um, left uh, had to leave the state house uh, as one of the most important things um, that's that's going to be needed uh, as people have lost income due to COVID nineteen. Clearly, uh, not everyone is uh, going to be able to make up lost income through unemployment insurance. Uh, and you know, we have um, Champlain Housing Trust has provided you with uh, estimates of uh, both the nonprofit housing sector's potential rental losses as a result of. Uh, uh, tenant lost income and also included an amount in there for uh, private sector for profit landlords uh, to help make them whole. Um, so, you know, some of that can come from community development block grant funds. Um, I believe you heard uh, Josh Hanford uh, talk about um, the $4.2 million that the state is receiving uh, in CDBG funds, um, sort of in three different buckets one being for rental assistance, uh, one for um, uh, sort of small business, uh, uh, micro business type assistance, uh, and another to uh, help support um, some of the uh, community facilities and community services uh, like the food banks and the, and the food shelves that um, have been doing yeoman's work during uh, during the pandemic. Um, the uh, FEMA funds, as I mentioned, uh, I can you know we, we're familiar with those from uh, Tropical Storm uh, Irene and from other natural disasters we've seen around. Uh, the country, but uh, obviously those can be used for a broad array of uh, uh, COVID-19 related expenses, everything from uh, personal, uh, from PPE, personal protective equipment to meals uh, and with approval to non-congregate non shelter uh, in motels. And I'm not aware that that approval has come through yet, but that would be a, a significant uh, thing uh, to have uh, FEMA be able to uh, pay for the motel stays. Uh, on the national calls that I've been on, a number of calls, uh, see a number of states um, are making significant use of FEMA dollars to help pay for uh, motel stays. Uh, most notably, uh, I think North Carolina is one, Connecticut, uh, which is uh, very closely parallels uh, Vermont in, in their uh, homeless response, um, is, is another uh, that is tapping FEMA for that. Um, uh, again, we have emergency shelter grants. Uh, with uh, solutions grants uh, rather, which are not just for emergency uh, shelter operations, uh, but can also pay for motel stays. Uh, they can pay for cleaning supplies, case management, uh, hazard pay, rental assistance, housing navigation. Uh, and the state has already received um, or is receiving uh, 2.3 million uh, as a first installment of these funds uh, expected to be up to a potential total of 4.6 million. Um, the CDBG dollars, um, Burlington's also receiving $450,000. And again, uh, the plan uh, that we've heard from uh, DHTD, uh, and I believe you've heard as well, is uh, to spend it in those, those three buckets. Um, uh, that money is all going to go fast. Um, and so we are going to have to rely significantly on the, corona, the flexible coronavirus relief funding, uh, which also allows for a very broad array of uh, different expenditures related to uh, the response, uh, including uh, landlord outreach, supportive services, eviction prevention assistance, um, um, moving folks uh, from motels into uh, uh, leased uh, hotel motels uh, with option to purchase as proposed by Housing Vermont and, and Champlain Housing Trust. Um, as well as uh, capital for um, uh, rehabilitating and standing up permanent supportive housing. Uh, right. I, I will say, go ahead. I, I just have three three folks who want to ask questions at this point. Okay. Um, Representative Kalecki. Thank you. I heard, I, you uh, when we heard last week from uh, Commissioner Schatz and, and uh, Chris Donnelly and other folks, it seemed that there was this moment there's a real consensus and a kind of direction that everyone seems like we understand this is the 
the best path forward here or a better path forward perhaps. And my, my question is how can we take this kind of consensus with the administration, with all the different advocates and actually shape it into something concrete versus each of the advocates coming for a piece of it. And it's sort of uh, asking for itself, but it's it's forgetting this group. And because I think this holistic moment could be here. And you know, it could be that this committee actually drafts a bill about it, but it's it's tricky to do piecemeal. I mean, even when the Senate did the um, political ideas, the, the wages uh, for essential workers. So many people feel they've been left out. So it's a tricky thing for a committee to do something like this. But I think even with our Senate colleagues, this is a moment, but I don't know how to get everyone working together, even with the administration, because I don't think they're oppositional in any of this. I, I mean, I think people are working together. Uh, and you also heard from Gus uh, Seelig and uh, Jen Holler, um, which, you know, they put together a proposal. It is, uh, you know, doesn't have a dollar amount attached to it, um, but they were suggesting that you and your um, Senate committee counterparts basically uh, ask them to stand up um, quickly, uh, an ad hoc uh, committee um, to basically lead, uh, lead this kind of uh, concerted effort in collaboration, you know, with all the other partners, uh, whether it be DCF and OEO, uh, the State Housing Authority, the Housing Finance Agency, uh, the nonprofit network of, of homeless service providers. Um, you know, it, it, this is a unique moment. And I think, uh, you know, VHCB um, is in a unique position uh, because of the way they uh, uh, fund um, and provide the capital funding for the nonprofit housing network. Uh, I think they're in a unique position to help uh, lead that effort. I don't think it would require legislation, as you know, um, from your experience with the eviction moratorium, and admittedly, that was a very complex bill, and uh, uh, you know required a lot of work by uh, folks who are not usually on the on the uh, same um, on the same side of, uh, of of a complicated issue. Um, it, it took a while to put together uh, legislation, and the legislative process, especially now when it's remote, um, takes longer than it normally does. So I, I would say even just a you know a joint. Uh, a joint letter from the two committees um, saying, "Here's, you know, here's what we would like you to do um, along the lines of the proposal from VHDB, and and it would take into, you know, I think CHT and Housing Vermont have done a lion's share of the work in terms of uh, assessing uh, what the needs are. Um, it's a proposal that is not all inclusive. There are other elements that need to be added to that, uh, but I think it's it's uh, one that um, clearly uh, can be built off." Uh, and, and built on, um, but it's going to require you all as a committee and your Senate counterparts to tell your appropriations colleagues in very short order that this is a unique moment uh, and it's going to require a substantial portion of these federal resources. And even though we are looking at a $430 million potential shortfall for next fiscal year, it's going to require ongoing uh, investments um, the ones that you know about that we come in every year talking about, whether it's you know more money for VHCB or uh, family supportive housing, the HOP program, you know all the programs that we uh, have talked to you about you know, um, during during the, the regular session. Um, so I think yeah, just um, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily require legislation. Uh, I think uh, it just requires you know some clear a cl clear messaging. Um, both to uh, the network of housing and homeless service providers, um, to VHDB and the other partners, and to your appropriations colleagues. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Thanks. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Representative Hango, and then um, Representative Gonzalez, and then Representative Triano, and then. Um, I'm going to pull, I'm going to move over to Gene at 1145 um, okay. to, so we're just going to work till that point with, with Earhart, yeah. uh, Representative Hango. Thank you. Um, Earhart, the document you sent us outlines the like total federal amount and mm -hmm. I missed what you said Vermont's portion of the FEMA grant is going to be. Uh, that would be 
to be determined okay. um, based on uh, what uh, that that's something that the emergency operations center and the administration would basically put together a uh, request to FEMA. Um, they, you know, we have approval. We were one of the last states to get that approval, um, but they would be putting together that, that proposal to FEMA. Okay, thank you. And those three um, different buckets that you outlined, the CDBG funds of 4.2 million, the emergency solutions grants of 4.6 million and the FEMA funds, do they come out of the 125 million of coronavirus no. funds or the 150? They, uh, they do not come out, the coronavirus relief funds is its own separate tranche. Um, the CDBG and emergency solutions grants, uh, they're under the bucket of what I would call categorical funding uh, that has certain, uh, you know, cer certain designated uses. So they're not part of the 1.25 billion? No, no, they are not. They're not. There's, there's approximately, um, I'm, if I'm remembering the number, overall uh, $11 billion in HUD funds uh, nationally that um, these uh, the, our share of CDBG and emergency solutions grants, uh, Section 8 rental assistance um, for people with uh, rental assistance subsidies, public housing, uh, they come out of the uh, out of the categorical bucket, not part of the 1.25 billion in coronavirus relief funds. Thank you. Um, okay, Representative yeah, Tran. Knowing that you want, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, our housing trust agencies. Uh, Memorial Housing uh, uh, Authority uh, has been instrumental in, in providing a lot of uh, good housing through our my area. Um, and are, will they be included? How, how, what's the thought? What are your thoughts on that, uh, Earhart? Um, so I, I was not directly involved in um, putting together Champlain Housing Trust and Housing Vermont's proposal, but I know that they surveyed uh, our nonprofit network, including Lamoille Housing Partnership, uh, on what they saw as their needs uh, in, in Lamoille County, uh, both what they uh, expected they might lose in terms of uh, rental income due to uh, people's uh, wage, uh, wage losses, uh, as well as uh, what their potential um, you know, for moving folks was out of uh, out of motels. Um, I also quickly mention, uh, you know, we didn't forget Lamoille County in our mini grants. We gave uh, um, uh, a, a small um, forty nine hundred dollar grant um, to the uh, Lamoille Community House as well to help with their efforts because uh, they've gone beyond uh, their normal uh, April April fifteenth um, okay. date. Oh, good. Um, uh, Lamoille. Comes all it comes into Hardwick as well. They've done a number of yeah. really outstanding projects, including the, the uh, yeah, they do uh, the Cherry Street uh, senior housing project as well. So um, I, that was thank you. Um, all right. Um, so knowing that you want to get to some other folks, uh, let me just hit on a, a couple of uh, uh, high points. Uh, just one with all this, even with all this federal money, um, there are still going to be some fairly substantial funding gaps. Uh, and we're working with our congressional delegation, with our national and regional uh, advocacy allies uh, to try and make sure that uh, hopefully there will be another uh, uh, a COVID 4.0 um, that will have a substantial, a more substantial housing investment in it. Our national association has. Uh, uh, is asking for a hundred billion dollars in emergency rental assistance. Um, so we're we're working with them on that. Um, some of the things that uh, I just want to touch on briefly that were uh, not necessarily uh, highlighted or uh, included in the uh, 106, uh, the 106.5 million dollar proposal from Housing Vermont Champlain Housing Trust uh, that needs to get added. Um, and that's why I think uh, you know having DHCD or another one of the state agencies. Um, sort of lead the uh, lead in that task force uh, to put it all together would be important. Uh, one is our homeless shelters and service providers all have uh, costs uh, as uh, extraordinary costs as a result of uh, the pandemic that um, uh, need to be added in. Um, you're going to hear from Patrick about Pathways uh, Vermont's proposal, which is part of the solution, uh, and and uh, also help supplement what CHT and uh, Housing Vermont put together. Um, we need to remember that SASH is there to uh, help uh, provide supportive services in affordable housing, and it's currently limited to 54 SASH panels uh, around the state serving 5,000 folks. 
as our nonprofits are going to be uh, called upon to serve more of uh, this high need, relatively high needs population that's currently in motels. Uh, additional support and services at home funding would help provide the supportive services that those folks need um, to, to succeed in, in, in affordable housing. Um, you heard from both Sarah Carpenter and Josh Hanford. Um, I will just underline their testimony. Uh, we need more money for housing rehab, uh, for for-profit, for the for-profit sector, uh, sort of building on the governor's VHIP proposal that is yet to be funded um, to do uh, housing rehab and bring back uh, substandard and, and uh, vacant properties back online. And finally, to stand up our uh, apartment housing registry. Uh, if I have to go through another statewide um, disaster um, in a few years, and hopefully I'll be retired by then, but uh, if we don't have a registry that tells us where the vacant apartments are, to where we can relocate people in these disasters, uh, I don't know. I, I think Chair Stevens and others know how um, uh, I think how important this is. This is an opportunity uh, to stand up that uh, that registry, and and then. Uh, you know, when we return to some form of normalcy, um, have uh, fire safety, um, you know, implement the proposal for statewide code and for uh, minimum housing enforcement. Um, I'll also just quickly mention um, and, and stress uh, that housing counseling and legal services are going to be needed, especially as the moratorium, the emergency period in the moratorium uh, comes to a close, um, because people will uh, will need uh, both uh, legal aid uh, as well as our home ownership centers, uh, counseling them uh, in potential foreclosure uh, or eviction uh, situations uh, for non-payment. Um, also mentioned that nobody has talked much about homeless encampments, uh, but we probably will have homeless encampments with us even uh, after this transition. And uh, you want to make sure that there are support and services and safety measures uh, for those folks and that we follow uh, the, um, um, the CDC's guidance not to clear encampments at a time when we need to uh, practice um, social and physical distancing. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, also, um, we will need uh, a broader array of supportive services uh, and capacity funding uh, for everything from household budgeting to tenant readiness skills uh, and community leadership uh, as we as we move out of um, out of uh, into a post COVID nineteen world, uh, I mentioned VHCB's comprehensive proposal. I I would urge you to call upon them uh, to stand up uh, this ad hoc task force, bringing together everybody and all the proposals, um, and uh, putting them in, into a package. Um, but I do meanwhile urge you to send a letter to your colleagues on appropriations uh, as soon as possible uh, to let them know, uh, you know what you see as uh, the need in this unique moment for housing and homelessness and uh, lay claim to uh, at least that 106.5 uh, million, uh, but really preferably more because I think that's not going to be enough. Uh, I just say in closing that um, this crisis is a, a very stark reminder that our health depends on the health of others. Uh, and when the most vulnerable people in our community are safe, we're all stronger. Um, shelter providers, um, most notably Rita Markley from COTS, used to talk about working uh, her way out of, out of business. Uh, COTS is the Committee on Temporary Shelter. And here we are over 35 years after COTS was founded with a unique opportunity uh, to move a giant step towards this long-lasting goal of ending homelessness in Vermont. And we know what to do, and now it's now the time to do it. So I thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any further questions if, uh, if you have them. No, thank you, Earhart. And I think that one of the things that is in front of us as a committee um, and as a community is to take um, your phrase, which is uh, I've had the privilege to hear for quite some time of we need more money to putting a number on it. Um, because there, I mean, and that means being inclusive to all of the number of different communities that we're talking about, because it's one thing for us to do like we did in March and guesstimate a number and put a placeholder and think that, oh my goodness, that's, that's going to be sufficient or not. Um, but the numbers are based on our experience, just in the way that we've been on business for some time, the numbers are staggering 
Um, but the need is staggering. And I do appreciate you coming at this as, as um, we don't need to reinvent the solutions. We need to find the capacity to do it, um, whether that's political or financial. So thank you for your time. I know you'll be listening in on all of the conversations that we have in this um, under this category and look forward to hearing from you um, in the near future. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. Sure. Um, I'm going to uh, go over to Jean Murray now. Jean, um, you are here, I think, specifically to talk about the rental situations across the state or what you've experienced. Um, I would also just just based on what I heard from representative from 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 Earhart um, in general, when we talk about providing these services. I mean, so so we took great testimony earlier this year on the rental arrearage program. We actually took it last year where the desire was to, to um, increase the funding in the HOP, op, the, the Housing Opportunity Grant Program. That exists and where legal aid is working in the north uh, west corner up in Franklin County in particular with some success. We took testimony on the success of that this, this year. But if we were able to increase the funding for rental assistance and rental arrearages. One of the things that stood out was the need to have, the, the way that the rental arrearage program was working was through um, legal aid, essentially offering pro bono services to tenants in particular. What kind of capacity increases are you going to, would legally need in order to pull that off? So I just want to plant that up with you and, um, have you add that into the the ingredients of your testimony? Thanks. My microphone is yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, I am Jean Murray from Vermont Legal Aid, and I I really um, the S three thirty three passed the Senate today, and I really want to express my appreciation to this committee for everything it did to uh, bring that about. I'm, really, it's like one of the best things that's ever happened. It's responsive. It shows that the legislature cares about Vermonters who are homeowners and who are tenants and who are landlords. And it, it I just can't uh, be appreciative enough. If I could bake, I'd send you all pies. Um, I can't bake though, so that's not gonna work. Um, I want to talk about uh, preventing evictions. We've heard a lot about people who are homeless and in need of permanent um, housing, the ones that are currently housed in motels, and what it might take to house those people. Um, but there's another population, almost as large at this moment, who is about to be homeless. And there are things that we can do right now to prevent ev evictions and prevent more people from becoming homeless. To me, these fall into two big categories. I wanna talk about how we can use right now the coronavirus relief funds um, to pay for back rent and uh, do rental assistance throughout the, to, until the end of the year. And the other thing I want to talk about is barriers that uh, tenants um, face when they are trying to find housing or trying to stay in housing. In terms of barriers that tenants face, um, this, this situation is, is a bit unusual. I am totally on the side of everybody that Earhart just mentioned and all the providers that um, have talked about what they need in order to um, keep people housed. But usually, as a Vermont legal aid lawyer, I'm on the other side. And uh, in trying to get ready for today, I pulled some statistics of what, what my experience has been as a legal aid lawyer here in 22 years. And we have a database, and I could go look in the database and find out how many people I've helped. So I've been at Legal Aid for 22 years and I've had 491 housing clients, including 33 foreclosure clients. And in addition to that, 
I have represented 590 collection clients, people who are being sued for debt. And I spent a year at Lawline where I uh, served another 300 collection clients and another 60 foreclosure clients. So what that experience um, informs me of more than anything else is what does poverty look like? How are the people who are um, experiencing poverty, how are they experiencing it? And how is the help that we plan for them not helping? Um, there have been dozens of cases where I see the reason that somebody is uh, being informed that they're going to lose their subsidy or being informed that they're gonna lose their subsidized housing or, or being informed that they are going to be evicted from their housing. And I look at the reasons that are given and I think, that's crazy. That it, it's crazy why we evict people and, and how, how much our solutions that we think about um, fall short and are I, unfair in a certain way. So I wanna talk about those things. Um, first and foremost, uh, I have I have notes and my notes are a little uh, you know a little more well crafted, um, but I really want to be frank about what's going on. Vermont has a rolling homelessness crisis. Last fiscal year, there were nearly 1,800 eviction cases filed, but this fiscal year to date, the one that started last July 1st, there have been. 1,342 filed. Um, and filed cases is not the only indicator of how many people are losing their housing to eviction because eviction process starts with a notice of termination and some tenants receive the notice of termination and leave before the landlords ever go to file in court. So there are more evictions than that. And there are more evictions that can be saved than that because if the evictions are for non-payment, when you get a termination notice, if you can pay the what's owed fast enough, the termination goes away. And that's one of the shortcomings is um, even if there are back rent programs and, and there are not back rent programs that pay all the back rent owed, um, they don't work very quickly uh, to save tenancies and there should. But right now, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which is Title V of the CARES Act, has sent $1.25 billion to Vermont. And that can be used to prevent evictions from the end of the year, through the end of the year. Um, Earhart was talking, and I've seen the document, the um, CSH document that talks about how those funds can be used. And that's a really useful document. There's also, in terms of trying to understand where all the categorical money is coming from and how is that different than the coronavirus relief fund. There's a document that is in the um, documents of joint fiscal and it's called, um, I think it's called COVID-19 tracker or CARES Act tracker, just the, the document that says tracker, which shows where all the funds are coming in to the various agencies in Vermont. Um, and that's very useful to get like a, a picture to time to see what agencies are getting the funding. From that document, um, rental assistance is not going to be able to be provided with uh, ESG grants. Uh, and though um, Department of Housing and Community Development has dedicated uh, $1.8 million to rental assistance, $1.8 million is not gonna be enough. So that's why I turned to the Coronavirus Relief Fund, um, the $1.25 billion that will have a lot of demands on it, but isn't spent. And housing uh, helps in Vermont have been underfunded as people have talked about for a very long time. So I think in terms of rental assistance money and preventing evictions, preventing this next thousand people from becoming homeless, that's where we need to look. Um, 
So we know from the housing needs study that the reason that people um, usually get evicted is because rents are high and incomes are low. Um, their cost burden, um, half of Vermont's renters are cost burden, meaning they're paying more than 30% of their income for rent. And so when you're paying more than 30% of your income, that means in any given month, a household may go without the necessities of life in order to pay the rent. The households live on the edge. And if one thing goes wrong, um, such as now going wrong in the pandemic, a reduction in paid work hours, or um, other things that can go wrong, an increase in childcare costs, an illness, uh, a change in the family, people can get behind in rent. Um, another thing, that is really notable and having worked with a lot of clients who are behind in rent, say, well, what did you, you know, here's your income. They tell me their income. What did you spend your income on? Well, I had to pay hundreds of dollars for heat. And how did that happen? Or is there storm windows on your house? Um, uh, do you have uh, drafts? What kind of heating system is in your house? because if you have one Renai heater in a two bedroom apartment and the Renai heater's at one end and the bedrooms are at the other, you have to run that thing all the time in order to get any heat in the bedrooms at all. So the cost of heat in substandard housing can lead to non-payment of rent. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is, why don't you just move if you can't pay the rent? Cost burden budgets are so tight, some tenants become homeless after an eviction because it's impossible to save for a security deposit. Landlords right now, many landlords are asking for first month's rent, last month's rent, and a security deposit. Even if there are security deposit funds available, and even if a person can access those timely, which arguably they can't, um, they, they can't get three months rent together ahead to get a place to live. So those um, kind of funds need to be uh, made more available and, and paid for more. Um, people with subsidies live on the same edge. When we talk about tenants paying 30% of their income for rent, they pay 30% no matter how low their income is. So for example, current SSI payment levels are 870 a month. That means rent is 261, which leaves people with $141 a week to pay for everything else, electric, phone, cable, some food, they may get food stamps, but food stamps doesn't pay for everything. If they have a car, which they need to get to medical appointments, they may need to make a car payment and pay car insurance. Can you imagine trying to do all of that on $141 a week? So then if you look at the case of a person who is earning Vermont minimum wage for full-time work and they have a subsidy, then they end up paying $556.24 a month for rent and they have $302 a week for necessities, almost double, but they're not eligible for food stamps and they're not eligible for Medicaid. And so they need to pay for those two big ticket items um, and electric and phone and cable and car payment. So they are on the edge all the time. Um, evictions are traumatic and destabilizing and have lasting effects on tenants and their communities. Uh, one thing I always think about, I did some work for education and people, uh, students being excluded from school across Vermont a few years ago. And a statistic that I found was that people, students who are receiving free and reduced price lunch, 40% of them were likely to start the school year in one place and end the school year in another place. And that's because of eviction. That's because they needed to move in order to have housing. So eviction, hurts communities in that way. And I want people to think about exactly what eviction means. Eviction means that a tenant has a home and wants to stay in their home, but is being compelled to leave through legal process. So 
this isn't uh, people moving out at the end of their lease because they found a better place or they want a better location. These are people being forced to move and they're being forced to move at numbers over a thousand a year, way over a thousand a year. So even though um, of the 72,000 Vermont renter households, only 2.5 of them are being evicted a year, 2.5% of them are being evicted a year. That's a lot of households. Um, and that's every year. So I think during this crisis, Vermont should fully fund a program for back rent. Um, when you get my notes, there's a link to them, to the study that Legal Aid um, released last year about evictions in court and the reasons for them. But here are the highlights. 75% of the evictions in court ultimately result in judgment for possession of the landlords and the vast majority of evictions are for non-payment. So we need to do something now about non-payment evictions that are coming up um, so that we don't create a whole new raft of homeless people. And I didn't originally have this in here, but of course it makes sense to fund um, lawyers for tenants because most people uh, facing an eviction in court don't have a lawyer. And so um, Representative Stevens, you mentioned the uh, Franklin County rent escrow clinic. And so how that happens is um, the people who are being evicted for non-payment and their landlords file for rent escrow, which as we have talked about a lot, is a, a, a hearing fairly early in the eviction process that guarantees that some rent is being paid into court while the whole case gets decided on. So at that juncture, um, uh, tenants get to meet with a lawyer and also meet with the local um, providers, the HOP program people, to find out if they can get uh, back rent and, and if those kind of programs that are available would solve the problem so that they can defeat the eviction. So bringing all of those um, resources together, that's, that's going on right now just in Franklin County. In Chittenden County, Rutland County, Washington County, and to a lesser extent in Caledonia and I think Wyndham as opposed to Windsor, um, we have attorneys uh, going to court on rent escrow day and saying, hey, I'm here, can I help? And obviously that's not all the counties and that's not as organized as approach as what we're doing in Franklin County, um, but it does help. It, it helps people get control of their lives. It helps people plan, it helps people access services, it gives people more time. And so if you ask me, do I think that we need more lawyers in court to, uh, to help uh, tenants from becoming evicted? I would say, yes, we need more lawyers to help tenants from becoming evicted. Um, can we, so can, Jean, can I, can I interrupt now? Just we have like a, a couple of questions before we get to the next step, or do you just, do you have, um, or do you wanna finish up with what you're saying? Uh, before I mean, no, we'll I, come, we'll come back to you certainly. But we just have three lined up, and I just want to make sure we don't go. Well, you were talking twenty minutes ago, so um, I just want to okay. see if this is contemporary stuff. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, Representative Triano. Uh, yes, a couple of things occurred to me, um, Gene, as you were speaking. Um, and it's uh, if, if if someone makes minimum wage and has two or three children, they're not necessarily disqualified from food stamps and Medicaid. Um, and sure. I think uh, oftentimes what we're seeing um, people struggling because they're trying to support two or three children. Uh, their struggle is more um, uh, as to uh, you know how to pay their rent and how to you know provide food for their family and medication uh, if needed. So. Uh, you know, I just that, that occurred to me that that was the case. Um, it, can I can I just briefly to that real quick? Yeah, sure. The housing yeah. is showing that the fastest growing kind of household in Vermont are uh, single person households. So I I yeah. think I saw a statistic like sixty nine percent of households renting households in Vermont are single person. So um, I did use the single person. 
um, figure. Um, the other so, thing that just occurred to me is, you know, uh, I worked um, in community action uh, in the Northeast Kingdom in the or mid 1970s. What we saw more often than not, when you speak about the face of poverty, we saw generational poverty. We saw people who were not in housing crisis because they inherited um, a, a home um, from uh, maybe two or three generations prior to them. Uh, but the home was so in such bad shape due to the poverty is what we were trying to repair at that time. So, you know, that it just, the face of poverty is not only people who are struggling to pay their rent, it's people who are struggling, um, who have ha housing, but are struggling to stay alive, basically. And it just occurred to me as you started talking about the face of poverty, that was what popped into my mind. Um, but tell me what, what you would think full funding would be for the rent arrears program to legal aid. I mean, I, I, it was my understanding, I think it's about $800,000 right now. That was the that was the ask when we released the eviction report. Eight eight hundred thousand okay. dollars would fund right. a, a number of legal aid attorneys who could meet people um, at rent escrow hearings and help them. So that is the figure. Um, I'm a little flat footed. I haven't um, recalculated the figure okay. based on what's going on. I, I, okay. We're actually anticipating that this is going to be a bit of a mess because um, filing of uh, eviction and ejectment cases has slowed down. Um, yep. And what we suspect is once the emergency is over, lots and lots of cases are going to get filed. And yep. um, also we're hoping that in one way, form or another, whether it's this coronavirus relief fund or it's uh, the CDBG money, that there is going to be rental assistance available. But we also suspect that it, it's not going to be like, uh, send the money over. It's going to be a process for people to apply and get the money. And that's going to create delays. And, and people are going, and landlords are going to say, this has been delayed long enough. And when is this really going to happen? And so we are anticipating it's going to be a big um, crunch. Uh, whenever the emergency is over. Would, it's hard I would to would agree. Uh, just it, to conclude it quickly, or uh, if I can, that you know, my daughter just went through a rent crisis in New York City um, when her roommate moved out and her rent was $3,500 a month. Um, so what she had done is studied a lot about the uh, rental uh, uh, situation in New York, and they just actually have uh, abated uh, first and last uh, month demands for um, for uh, uh, landlords uh, who uh, are or for rentals actually, and uh, maybe that's something we should be thinking about as well. Uh, that she uh, did require a security deposit of which was equal to a month's rent in the new place that she moved in, but first and wa uh, last have been waived. Uh, you right, know. So Go ahead. Oh, that's it. Uh, no, I was. <laughs> Go ahead, Jean. I mean, there are a lot of ideas out there uh, of, of handle things differently, and and just like everything else, just like the uh, roadmap to end homelessness, we need to have the will um, to do it, and. Uh, there are a lot of different, uh, like I saw a, a bill that's going to be introduced in Illinois that would essentially say all rent is canceled um, and the program would be for landlords to apply to make themselves whole. Um, and it was for a, a period of time, like 180 days. Um, so there's lots of ideas out there about how to make this easier. I, I guess one of the things that I was thinking about was build on the ideas that we already have, but fully fund them and fully fund them through the end of the year with the coronavirus relief fund. Is, is, was there another question or? Yes, I have two, um, I have two uh, here. I have Representative Byrong followed by Representative Hango. No, uh, Representative Hango is all set right now. Um, so Representative Byrong. Um, thank you. I just wanted to circle back to the conversation on the eviction rates. 
Um, you said that we had about a 2.5% eviction rate in the state of Vermont. I was just curious how that compares to a national average. Well, there's a great book there. I didn't, I didn't do that research, but there was a, a Harvard um, eviction lab wrote the book eviction and had, there are uh, sources that can say uh, what the eviction rate is um, in various places. Some places it's higher and some places it's, it's, lower, but I don't have that answer for no, you. I mean, I would assume that. I just didn't know if we were like in the middle, if we were, if we had a higher eviction rate than other places, other states, lower in the middle. I was just trying to gauge it as a, a, a to help form the template of the conversation. Um, so. Yeah, others, it, our evictions have to be through court. Um, other states have different uh, methods of eviction. Ours have to be through court. So sometimes it's, it's comparing apples and oranges. If you're in a state where the right. landlord can just go put a piece of paper on your door and you have to be out three days later, it's hard to compare, compare that to our process. Um, so- No, and I, I know we have a, a, a more engaged and involved process to evict someone from their, from their home. Um, I would just be interested to see then how we compare to states that have a similar operating procedure as ours just to get an idea of, you know, if it, it would give me a sense of whether or not our current system is how it is functioning. If we're looking at lower or higher or moderate rates, I just think it would be a useful measurement if that information was attainable. Well, I guess if, if you ask me, our eviction rate's too high because uh, tenants are going in unrepresented and they, many, many of them don't get access to programs to help them and they get evicted, so. Uh, no, no, and I understand your point of view from your organization for sure. Yeah, I was just curious, like what a, a, a like a data driven sort of analysis of comparatives would look like. I, I can find that for you and and send it in with my um, written testimony. Cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. Any further questions for Gene or final comments for, from you, Gene? Um, Before we move over well, to that. I did want to get to some of the things that are barriers to um, people uh, in finding housing and keeping housing. One is unlawful discrimination. I don't know if people know this, but uh, Vermont's law prohibits discrimination against um, receipt of public assistance. That's a state law that makes a lot of sense. It, landlords can't decide, I'm not going to rent to you because uh, your income is from public assistance or that you're trying to rent with a, a rental subsidy, a tenant-based subsidy. So technically that's on the books and prohibited, but it's not enforced. We don't have a way to enforce it. We don't actually have a culture that says it's okay it, it, you, it's not okay to discriminate against people who receive public assistance. Um, so there's, uh, in addition to public assistance discrimination, there is a lot of discrimination against people with disabilities. Um, that's where Housing First programs come in and, and where, so they need more help because um, Landlords uh, say, I don't want to rent to somebody who had to have a worker, help them get the place. That means that they're trouble. Um, and they're not necessarily taking into account that uh, the person's disabilities could be reasonably accommodated. So we do have a lot of housing discrimination going on and that is a contributor to homelessness. Um, when we think about the, coronavirus relief funds and making rules about how to give them out for uh, rental assistance, we shouldn't repeat um, some of the barriers that have arisen with the rules that we already have. Um, I have had uh, tenants uh, evicted because they couldn't, uh, they didn't do some paperwork that they were supposed to do. They didn't recertify on time every year. And I've seen these forms and it's akin to applying for a mortgage every year. It's quite a bit heavy paperwork burden. And the housing authorities that ask for this paperwork, they don't have enough staff to sit down with everybody and help them fill it out. So um, 
to avoid being uh, evicted for paperwork um, shortages, there needs to be more staff and there just needs to be a determination that somebody shouldn't lose their housing simply because they didn't get applications in on time. Um, so the other thing that people uh, get evicted for, uh, technically in subsidized housing, you're only supposed to be evicted for repeated and serious violations of the lease. But again, this is one of the things that I think about um, when I get a case, somebody is being evicted um, because their children are noisy or they've left their open or there's somebody on the lease not on the lease is staying with the tenant and the paperwork didn't get in to add that person to the household. Um, people get evicted because neighbors complain about parking spaces and surveillance cameras and funny looking guests and pets and trash and all of these uh, admittedly um, an annoying reasons, but they could be, uh, it's not that People shouldn't pursue the solution of the problems, but they should solve the problems rather than making the people homeless. Um, and so with coronavirus relief funds, um, that at least for a while, we could end up with the staffing necessary and the money necessary to keep people who are teetering on the edge of homelessness housed. Um, Oh, yeah, and the, my last point, um, which is everything that uh, that you already know and Earhart's already said, we need a red registry of rental housing and we need a statewide inspection system so that we, the current housing stock that is being rented, this is not vacant stock that needs to be re rehabbed, the current stock that is being rented is up to code and is um, in, is uh, providing a safe environment um, and a safe place to live for people. Without, I guess I want to harken back to my experience in Massachusetts as an attorney. Massachusetts has a statewide housing inspection system, and they have a law that if you have a code violation currently um, happening, you are unable to evict a person. It's a defense to eviction. Uh, unaddressed code violation. Um, it is in that way, landlords have an incentive to keep their properties up to code. Um, and it works pretty well. Mo more places in, in Massachusetts, in my experience, of course, this was more than 22 years ago, have uh, better housing conditions than uh, a lot of the places here in Vermont. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I, I want to say. There are specific things that could be done. For subsidized housing, there could be a law requiring uh, mediation in eviction cases so that the problems get solved and people don't simply aren't evicted because um, of, of lease violations. Um, so those are the the particular things I want to say, there's a population at risk of homelessness now, there is money to help them now, and I think that's what should happen. Well, thank you. I mean, this is, again, uh, this crisis is really exposing everything about everything um, when it comes to these circumstances. And I want to thank you for sharing sharing your testimony and um, anything that you can share with us electronically that we can put up on the website, that would be very helpful. We'll be there um, in a little please, bit. Thank you. Yeah, take your time. Um, so we'll pop right over to Patrick Gallagher from Pathways. Um, Patrick, thank you for joining us. I understand it's Pathways Day um, here in the State House, in the virtual State House. Um, I believe the Senate is also hearing from Pathways today. And um, one of the things, um, as you talk about your program, um, I just want to point out that there are other, um, well, Pathways has been in our committee and um, we have been working with Pathways for some years to try to um, extend the Housing First program as, as much as we can with the proper amount of funding. Um, 
I just want to acknowledge to everybody, we heard testimony last week that there are also agencies like Washington County Mental Health Service where there are um, also variations on the theme. It might be slightly different clientele, but that that um, I think what I appreciate about Pathways in general is that they've been able to really um, expand as much as they have and they've requested to expand much more and i just want to hear patrick just your thoughts on where the organization is in terms of what the near future may hold and in terms of providing solutions to along with some of these other agencies that already exist the um the i, I would call it medium term um solutions to what we're talking about um medium to long term because it can be but i think pathways has traditionally been transitional so microphone is yours thank you for joining us oh thank you for having me um speaking of landlords my landlord just showed up and started mowing the lawn so if that if you hear a lawn more in the background that's what that is just let me know um uh yeah so um i guess I, I'm, I'm here to talk about what we're currently doing um in the face of this pandemic at Pathways, um, how we're currently serving and then how we can see ourselves as being helpful to solve the, the current problem. Um, you know, the folks, the 1600 or so folks that are currently um, in motels. Um, we've adjusted our, um, our services to be able to um, keep both the, the folks we serve as well as our um, staff safe. Um, so that means that we're, um visiting people as as much as we can uh, via telehealth services and making sure they have the correct um technology internet access to keep them connected um and um, stay safe in their homes um as you may know the majority of people we work with are considered vulnerable uh, the most vulnerable um to this to the disease so it's very important to us to keep them safe um, especially at this time um, when this first began, I think we had some worries that we weren't going to be able to um, find housing, but that has not um, come to fruition. Um, it's been um, good news to see our housing team um, be able, we're actually housing, we've hit um, record numbers of people housed in a month. Um, so since mid-March, when this kind of all began, um, we've housed over 35 people around the state. Um, uh, in all areas of the state and we're doing that um, with cooperation from landlords who have really stepped up and I think uh, want to help understand uh, why it's so important to get people into housing especially now um, and keep them safe um, and as Earhart was alluding to before I think it's um, become very clear that helping the most vulnerable among us stay safe helps everyone stay safe um, and healthy at this moment. Um, so uh, we're still very much active, still very much housing folks and serving them, making sure they have their daily needs met, getting them food, supplies, uh, PPE supplies. We've had um, lots of people step up um, and either donate um, PPE items that we're able to get out there or make, don uh, make items, masks, et cetera. So that's been great to see the community step up and, and um, help those that we're working with. Um, we've put together, in terms of what's going on now, um, we've put together a proposal um, because we think that our Housing First services um, will play a part in being able to solve this, um, the, the problem of the 1600 folks that are kind of stuck in motels right now. We don't want to see them go back to the street. Um, or congregate settings and shelters. And uh, Housing First Services and what we provide are designed to permanently end that issue or the, that problem for folks. Um, so um, you know, we've been in, in your committee um, a number of months ago talking about um, the need uh, that we see in the state to expand these services into areas that don't have them. Um, so what we've uh, put together is a quick proposal uh, showing that um, with $2.5 million, uh, we'd be able to expand into the counties um, that we're currently not in. So uh, Rutland, Bennington, Orange, Lamoille, and the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and uh, we would need an additional uh, $1 million in rental subsidies to be able to house those folks and keep them housed. So the 2.5 would be for 
um, the services we provide. Um, that would uh, serve up to 200 uh, new individuals uh, and we'd be able to take them out of that um, or temporary motel stay and get them into permanent uh, apartments around the state. Um, so in a nutshell, that's our, our quick proposal as to what we're, we're talking about um, doing. And we, like I said, I think we wanna be a part of this solution because we know that these services are what permanently ends homelessness for folks. Um, and, um, you know, we're at a unique situation where it's both a crisis, but um, the crisis um, is kind of, um, showing us opportunities to really make uh, big changes um, in, in our society um, that could potentially in the end be positive. Um, so we are looking at this as an opportunity to, to help people out of homelessness permanently. Um, so that's really where we're at. Um, and yeah, I'd love to take your questions, see what you, what you think um, uh, about the proposal, um, about our services, Quick questions. Well, I, I say quick. I'm sorry. Two questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first is is the two is the three point five of the three point five million dollars in the request. What would be annualized from that? Uh, that is an annualized uh, amount. So so it's three point five annually. Um, on on top of on top of what we already um, budget you through the SSA program that you're in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is a. This is a. This would be. Um, you know, our services are a long-term commitment um, to to really um, address the situation for folks, and that's yes. So it's this would, and this would take your program statewide. I mean, it's been it's been it's been we've been going in bits and pieces. Exactly. And the, and the request is, earlier this year was only for two more counties, but this is to pretty much cover the rest of the state. Yes, we're, we put forth this proposal because we see, obviously there's a, there's, um, a pressing need um, and, a, and a large number that um, you guys are looking at needing to figure out what to do with. Um, so we're putting this proposal out as, this is what it would take to provide this statewide um, for these folks. So if you could just, and if we just take a step back now and just um, uh, saying it's housing first is like a simple one dimensional way of saying if we could, I mean, we, we know what it is. It's like, we're gonna put people in housing and provide them with services and we're gonna provide them with, with uh, an apartment. Um, they're gonna have bedding, they're gonna have silverware, they're gonna have things. So it's not like they're going from a campground to a, an inside campground, but it, can you can you just describe for us like what that process is and exactly who you're looking at when you're talking about getting out of the out of the 1,800 people you mm -hmm. wanna you wanna be able to have the capacity to house yeah. 200 more. So when you reach out to a landlord. How do you interact with the private landlords? Do you sign master leases? Do you deal, you know, how do you deal with uh, potential damage done to the apartment security deposits? If you could just give us a quick primer on on how that transition happens, how you how folks come to you and apply and then get into the housing, just so that we can have a full understanding. I don't want to just say, oh, you know, it's housing first. Don't yeah, you know? Um, I'd like to just get a little bit of education out there if we could. Sure. Um, so um, our programs are really designed to work with um, what would be deemed the hardest to house folks who have a long history of um, homelessness, um, traumatic events happening um, to them, incarceration, um, institutionalization. So first and foremost, we tend to be um, the, uh, the folks that take on um, the people that have fallen through the cracks or that other programs haven't worked for. Um, and one of the tenants, uh, the, the big tenants of what we do is that we do not um, pick and choose who we work with, right? So we, um, if someone want, the only real issue that we, uh, or question we ask folks before they, um, you know, work with us is if they want housing. Um, once we determine that they do want housing, um, uh, we will work with them no matter uh, what issues have prevented them from um, having housing in the past. Um, what that means is that we then, uh, we have a separate housing team from a services team. Um, our housing team does a needs assessment with uh, the future tenant 
to talk about what they need in housing and what they want, where they need to be um, located. Um, so we do an individualized housing search for that person um, in, in the community that they're looking to be in. Um, and we take into account if they need to be near transportation, um, you know, if they need to be on a first floor, um, you know, accessibility issues, et cetera. Um, if, they have a, if they have a dog, things like that, um, so that we find a good fit for them. And then we do an individualized housing search. And, um, you know, after 10 years of existence, we have lots of um, landlord relationships around the state. And that's um, one thing that makes this program really work. So our um, separate housing team works to ensure that we have strong relationships. Um, we work with over 150 landlords around the state. Um, so many of these, um, these the, the housing that we um, find are, you know, one, two, three uh, households or three apartments to a household type of um, situation, small landlords. Um, and if a land, normally, you know, we, there's a number of reasons landlord work with us. Um, they've, most of the time we find they want to help. Uh, and in the past, potentially they have felt, you know, burned by um, someone who may have a section eight voucher, but um, didn't have the services really to back that up. What we provide is a housing team that is there for a landlord to discuss any issues that are going on. And we look to mediate those issues um, as, as we move someone in and then throughout their, their tenure at the apartment. Um, when a landlord does agree um, to housing, um, we uh, work to get that person, well, first of all, most of the time we, the tenant is signing um, um, a lease themselves. Um, part of that is helping them understand the responsibility they have in that apartment. Um, it's their apartment and they have the same responsibilities as any other tenant in the community. Um, you know, that, that's another big thing that we, we really wanna do is help someone integrate into the community um, and understand their responsibilities as a tenant. Um, so most of the time, um, they are signing the lease. Um, we do have some instances where um, normally in our Department of Corrections program, we have a separate funding stream through Department of Corrections um, that we master lease, but the majority are, are tenant lease um, apartments. Um, we work to uh, ensure that they have, like you said, the basics when they move in. Um, so, you know, bedding, um, pots and pans, toiletries, et cetera, so they move in you know, to a home from day one, we're not just putting them into an empty apartment. Um, and from there, we provide uh, what we call wraparound services. So we have a separate services team that is separate from our housing team that um, works to um, really address issues that the tenant wants to work on. So we look to be non-prescriptive. We don't, from day one, walk in there and say, look, you need to be sober if you wanna keep this housing, for example. Um, we would go to them and say, look, what are your goals? Um, normally the first few goals are to have housing, to keep housing, um, to stay warm, uh, you know, and then from there we work on other things. They a lot of times want to reconnect with family. Um, they want to work on income, potentially work on substance abuse issues, um, things of those nature. And we really um, customize our service approach depending on what that person is self-identifying they want help with. So we'll help with um, identifying employment or help with um, you know, entitlements, et cetera, um, to make their uh, life sustainable um, and to help themselves improve themselves um, in housing. Um, and this is, you know, it's a long-term commitment we, we uh, make to folks. So we don't just put them into housing and then walk away a year later. Um, you, we're working with people who have uh, many times decades of, uh, you know, trauma and um, homelessness. Um, and that doesn't get completely uh, resolved, um, you know, within a few months. So this is a long-term commitment to folks. And, you know, after years, I've personally watched people go from you know, someone who has been on the streets um, for decades and you would never think would be able to work or live uh, peacefully in the community to, um, you know, living in the community, having a job, reconnecting with their family, um, you know, really being part um, of society again. Um, but it's a long-term commitment. Um, and in terms of if there's issues in that apartment, 
um, you know, we are available always to talk with the landlord and with the tenant about whatever's going on. Um, and we do our best to mediate that. Um, we do have, you know, we have an 85% retention rate, which means, you know, 85% of the folks that we work with stay housed. Um, that other 15%, like I said, we work with challenging um, individuals. Um, there might come a time where they need to move. Um, you know, the landlord's asking it, it's not a good fit, it's not working. Um, we will work as hard as we can to move them out without an eviction happening, um, without, um, you know, large costs piling up. And then we'll, what we don't do is give up on that person. If their subsidy is still intact, um, we make a plan um, to um, talk to that person about what happened, what needs to change, and what they're willing to commit to do to change um, in order to make housing work. And I've also seen, you know, folks who, uh, you know, quote unquote, burnt out of their first apartment make significant changes um, because part of this is a learning process around how what it means to be a good tenant um, and and you know how you can safely stay housed um, you know because losing that first apartment sometimes for folks is a big wake up call in terms of what behaviors need to change um, but I, what what's really important is that we don't go to them and say look you lost your chance see ya we we do our best to help them again um, obviously with um, new plans and, and new rules in place to help them um, sustain uh, a second second apartment if it need be. Um, so that was kind of a long within answer, but hopefully that gave you a little bit of it. It's short by legislative standards. Okay. Trust me. <laughs> um, and I and I do think that um, we have a question from Representative Howard. I want to go but, but to her in a second. But the first thing I want to do for committee and for folks that are watching, if you and maybe and and to our committee assistant Ron, if you can post some of the basic informational uh, in, in material that we have in our files on Pathways, I think all of these services are provided in a way that reduce the costs of uh, compared to what exists for the what we consider the status quo, which is homelessness is expensive. And, you know, providing emergency services or emergency room services is always much more expensive. And I think I've always been shaken by the the amount of savings that are reflected in the pathways materials. And so we have we have that and we'll repost it just so that people see that that supporting a program at $3.5 million annually may result in cost differentials that are significant. And um, and I think this goes to what Earhart was talking about earlier. We have ideas about how to tra trade off expenses that are more beneficial than, than the emergency services. But let's say, we'll, we'll post that and just have that as part of our, our larger conversation. Um, Representative Howard, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you, um, you're Thank up. you, Tim, and thank you, Pat, for your testimony today. I represent one of the um, districts in Rutland City, and a while back, we were told that you were coming um, to Rutland to set up an office, and then we were told you weren't coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we were very disappointed. Um, so I am um, excited to hear that you are considering coming to Rutland and other locations. Um, from what I have learned about your organization, uh, I have been very impressed. Um, actually, uh, Representative Gamash has, has uh, as a, uh, a land, previous landlord, uh, had a great relationship with your organization and, and that was good to know. So um, I just wanna say, I wish you the best and I certainly uh, look forward to seeing you um, come to Rutland. We, we need you, thank you. Well, thank you, yes. Um, yeah, I think we've always, um, We've always had the goal, you know, what we we believe that these services should be equitable across the state. Um, that, you know, um, as Representative Stevens was saying, we've kind of um, received piecemeal funding along the way and, and, and have spread out around the state, depending on where we've received funding to be. 
but we um, you know, have an internal um, goal and uh, desire to, be, um, to provide these services statewide um, because the need exists in every corner of the state um, and, you know, we want these services to be equitable. So yes, um, you know, it, if, if we've received the funding to do so, um, we um, see the need to expand these services. And I also want to mention that I'm, I'm pleased to see that you, that you do have a team. And if there is an issue that you um, work with the tenant and the landlord, because I have heard from good tenants, bad tenants, good landlords, bad landlords, and um, it can be pretty tense. So I'm, I'm pleased to know that. Thank and, you. And we, we separate our services for, for um, important reasons. Um, you know, in a more traditional model, um, the, the service coordinator, if you want to call them that, would be both the landlord liaison and uh, the um, you know, person providing services to the person who's housed. And that uh, creates a lot of weird power differentials when that person comes looking for rent or is kind of the person who needs to um, communicate the consequences uh, that the landlord is communicating. What we want to do is separate those so that there can be a, um, a real trust relationship built between the service coordinator, the person who's providing those essential services that can help change someone's life, and the person who's dealing with the more nitty gritty, how to keep you know rent, um, what the landlord needs, um, you know, expenses sides of things. So we, we um, really um, work to ensure that those two sides are, are separate and that the client understands that. Okay, thank you. Representative Hanko. Thank you. Patrick, I just wanted to know, um, cause I, I still am trying to fit the pieces together is um, Pathways, one of the agencies that would be benefiting from the state reorganizing the general assistance monies. Um, that's a restructuring that's supposed to happen next year, April, June, somewhere like that, that um, uh, Commissioner Schatz and others have talked about, OEO, um, Sarah Phillips, be honest, I'm probably not the best person to ask that question. Earhart probably has a better answer to that than me. Um, I don't know. Because the my understanding is that um, money would flow to local agencies as opposed to um, the, a statewide group deciding where the need is and where the funding is going. So that's what I'm trying to clarify is if your agency would get organization would get some assistance in that respect and more of a say where you operate and who you serve. So whoever can answer that, if you can, that would be great. Well, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure that that answer has been completely answered yet in terms of how much of a say we'd have in it. Um, obviously, we're part of the system um, uh, and, and would be looking to help folks with um, those funds. But in terms of where we're at with that, I can't, Era probably can't answer that clear. Thank you. Um, and Earhart, do you want to take a try at that or do we want to um, have a clearer answer provided at a different time? Well, I can answer briefly. Um, and I, I think the answer is it's not clear right now um, what is going to happen with that proposal. Um, as, uh, as you all know, um, your House Appropriations Committee basically had to abandon the budget that they were 80% done with on March 13th. And that is a budget that uh, at least postponed operationalizing that DCF OEO proposal until April 1st, 2021. Uh, um, I think the <clears throat> intent is still going to be to try and um, put greater emphasis and greater funding uh, to the local level um, and you know, we've seen that the local responses to the pandemic has been absolutely key and critical but I think uh, we're gonna have to wait and see uh, what the lessons learned are uh, from this response 
uh, before uh, people kind of regroup and, and figure out how that's going to play out. Uh, I would certainly hope since Pathways, um, you know, like other organizations, is part of that critical response uh, at the local level uh, in the areas that they currently serve, that they would uh, benefit uh, from whatever uh, funding, uh, additional funding might be moved out of the motel voucher program uh, into the local level, because clearly Pathways is part of, uh, through their work, is part of what is helping um, to at least keep the motel voucher budget prior to the pandemic as uh, not that it was low, it was high, um, but keeping it within uh, the bounds, uh, boundaries that we've seen as uh, they are serving folks who might otherwise be in motels. Thank you for that. Um, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse and I'm going in circles and probably everybody feels the same way at this point, but um, we did hear last week from DCF that uh, they plan to go forward with this. So it is my hope that were the organizations like this that are boots on the ground in communities will be funded in that way so that they can continue their work and that this money isn't just going um, to a model that no longer works. And we were clearly told before COVID-19 that the motel voucher system does not work, that it's broken. So um, I do hope everybody keeps that in mind as we go forward and that the powers who be are making those wise decisions. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um... Representative Gamash, you had your hand up before. Did you take it down or did I do that by mistake? No, I actually took it down, but I would like the opportunity to just reiterate. Um, I had mentioned before at a prior committee meeting from my own personal experience with Pathways that I can say everything that Patrick has just said is exactly right. They are there for their clients. They provide all the services that are needed and they work very well with the landlords so that if there is a problem, regardless of what it is with, that, with, with one of their clients, they step in in order to resolve the issue. And this is such a wonderful, um, it, it gives, Landlords, it's a, it's a reassurance that that if there is a problem, they have some, the landlord has somewhere to turn, and and the and the problem will be resolved one way or the other, to everyone's satisfaction. Um, my own experience, I never had. I never had a situation where. Well, I'm sorry. There was one situation where um, the client needed to be removed. And that had to do with their behavior, not in terms of the property, but related to an issue that got them involved in pathways, one of the pathways programs, and it was a violation that had happened then. And so they, they needed to be um, removed from the property. So, um, but there again, even in that in that situation, I mean, they just they were there, they're there for when when the need arises. And I really I can't say I can't praise them enough as a as an agency that really steps up to the plate and does what they say, and and is is you can always touch base with them. Your your when when you call upon them as a landlord they always respond in a timely way. And that is so very important. Um, that's all I'll say. Great. I think I've said it, I've said it. Thank you for that. I, we truly appreciate your support. And um, we do work hard to ensure, like I said, our landlord relationships are what make this program work. Um, it also it allows us to be nimble, right? And, and um, adjust and move people in quickly. Um, so we um, truly appreciate um, support like yours and um, work very hard to, to ensure that landlords understand uh, why we do what we do and feel supported and feel like they have someone to turn to um, when there are issues. Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a big part of what makes 
what makes this work. Um, so, uh, and another um, piece to this that I think is important to acknowledge is um, this is the, our program, like I said, is relatively, we can be relatively quick and hit the ground running. Um, so we do not need to build or rehab um, housing. We can we utilize current existing um, apartments uh, around the state. And in many areas around the state, there, there are um, available apartments um, that we can um, relatively immediately make use of. Um, and, you know, like I said, we work with some of the, the, the more challenging folks um, who, you know, congregate settings don't necessarily work out well and have proven that over a long period of time with those with that population. This allows people to integrate into the community and, and um, not be so segregated. Um, so there, there's some pluses, um, you know, um, in, in that area as well, um, along with the cost savings that uh, Representative Stevens was talking about. Thank you. Um, I just want to be mindful of time. It's 12 of 1 on my computer. Um, we do have, a, uh, I do want to talk to committee for a few minutes to talk about Friday a little bit, but um, I also want to get to Representative Kalaki and Triano. So Representative Kalaki, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, last week, we heard from Chris Donnelly um, about immediate needs. It was a sort of a framework of $106 million. Does your pathways component of the 2.5 million and the additional million that you wrote to the speaker, does that live within the 106 or is this something outside of that? This is something outside of that. This is uh, particular to our services um, that is outside of that, what they're talking about. Okay. Um, although we are, we are, you know, um, in that proposal, they are um, talking about the need for more housing first services. Um, and, you know, uh, we are supportive of, of providing more housing first services, um, you know, in the state, in Chittenden County, in the areas that we are currently serving. Um, so in that sense, you know, we're supportive of that. Um, but this proposal that we're putting out is, is separate. But why, why wouldn't yours be included? I, I'm just, I'm... I'm just trying to get a sense of the bigger picture and who's not in that 106 million. Yeah, um, in terms of why, um, I think we've, this is a um, separate proposal that we've come up with in terms of areas that we're not in. Um, so th these currently don't exist. Um, and so we weren't included in that 106 million because um, it wasn't a proposal that we were able to get in quick enough to get into that 106 million. Um, so it's um, a way to supplement what they're talking about um, to, to um, potentially house some of the more challenging folks out of that 1600. And are there other agencies not also in this 106 that you're aware? That that I can't answer. I, I don't know that. I just know. All right. A bit. Well, I, I really am, like everyone on the committee, I'm very supportive of what you do. It's pretty amazing. And we're just trying to respond yeah. as quickly as we can to all of this, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Representative Triano. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly mention, uh, Patrick, that, uh, you know, uh, from the first time I've heard of Pathways back on my years in Human Services Committee, um, the model seems to be a good fit, a good fit for what we need. So I'm encouraged by your notion to bring your services to parts of the state that, um, Currently, they're not, they don't exist. And particularly in the Northeast Kingdom, I've been in touch with our homeless coalitions and uh, in and, and, and cities and, or in towns that we have um, no shelters uh, available. And um, motel vouchers are the only answer, which we've been around with as far as the cost and, and some yeah. of the downside of that. Um, so um, I just wanted to encourage this uh, and uh, hope that it is not a competing interest in the proposal that we heard last week uh, for the 106 million or whatever. So, uh, but I, you know, I support Pathways in, in, in a big way. And I thought, if, I think if you could bring them into the Northeast Kingdom, where I mentioned before, generational poverty is what we're dealing with there um, still and, and 45 years after I worked there in, in that capacity. So. Uh, I just want to pledge my support to your program. 
Thank you for that. Appreciate it. And Representative Hengo. Just one question, and this is directed at anybody. I'm sure everyone else but me can answer this question. Remind me what the $106 million ask is. Uh, the $106 million ask was what was provided from us through Chris Donnelly's testimony. It was a memo that was in last week's testimony, so you can find the breakdown there. It was roughly 23 million dollars in uh, rental assistance and other programming to, to keep people in their homes now it was a 70 million dollar capital ask yeah and then about a four million dollar service ask um i don't know if that added up to everything that was there but that's the rough that's the rough numbers that were included and that was compiled by champlain housing trust and other housing folks up in chitton county and um, could you remind me also where that was coming out of in respect to the figures that Earhart gave us in terms of um, either the CARES Act or coronavirus funds or not, or the- um, I, My understanding, again, it's pretty clear in the memo. We can, we can go read it again, but I believe that that was not related to any of the um, uh, state minimums it may have been, it may have included some of the state minimums, but I think this was a proposal to talk, to tap into the CARES money uh, in, in terms of the relief money. Um, Earhart, if you have a quick clarification, that would be great. Very quick. Uh, I Is believe... that the community grants, Earhart? Or... Uh, well, no, actually the 106.5 million, the proposal was for all of that to come, uh, in the proposal was for all of that to come from the coronavirus relief funds. Although I will say some of the uh, expenses that are would come from some of the other categorical funding as well. And let me just also to Representative Kalaki's question, just say quickly that there was in that proposal, uh, Patrick may not have had a chance to go into the, the full budget. There was about $900,000 in there budgeted for pathways, for housing, for housing first. So there's a little bit of double coverage, but as Pat, Pat said, that comprehensive uh, proposal was developed uh, before uh, Pathways uh, had a chance to to get theirs uh, up and, and running. So they're they're not contradictory; they're supplemental to each other. And the nine hundred thousand was what the ask was to go to two yeah. uh, counties, yeah. whereas right. this is yeah. this is yeah. an expansion of that to try to get it statewide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris, uh, Chris and they they incorporated that original Pathways ask into their proposal, but weren't aware of this larger statewide proposal that Pathways has come up with. So Earhart, can you quickly say whether that 900,000 and the 106.5 million came out of one of the three buckets that you were talking about on the coronavirus relief funds? There was a 75 million, a 150 million, yeah. and a 125 million. Yeah, it, um, it would, uh, sorry if I wasn't clear, it would come out of the $1.25 billion bucket, uh, which I've referred to as the coronavirus relief funds uh, bucket, though with the footnote that some of those expenses could, uh, a small portion of them could come from some of the other CARES Act funding, but the request was for that to come from coronavirus relief, so from the 1.25 billion. And you had broken those down into, in that 1.25 billion down into three different um, categories of 75 million, 150 million, and 125 yeah. million. Any Based on the action of the joint fiscal, uh, com your joint fiscal committee, yes. That was the 150 million that, that was. Uh, that was the 1.25. That was a three-way breakdown of the 1.25 billion dollars in coronavirus relief funds per uh, so, per year joint fiscal action. So there, so there's joint fiscal committee has has broken out this 70 million. The, the, the numbers that you just listed, and so some of that's administration um, expenditures, yeah. and some of that will be okayed by the JFO. 150 million, yeah. 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 And then I think we're left with the 1 billion yeah. and Just 25 over. and 25 million. So um all right, I um before we go so so committee what I really want to do is first of all I just want to uh, say uh, Ron has posted information onto our website from the JFO, from Pathways, from Gene Murray um, to follow up on the on the testimony we received today. Um and then uh, I think Ron, um, I think I'd like to sign off in a, in a half a minute. 
from the live feed and just talk to the committee for a couple of minutes afterwards, if I could do that. So um, I would like to thank Jean and Earhart and Pat for joining us today. Um, it's a, again, it's a lot of information to take in. Um, I, let's utilize the information that's on our website um, to try to wrap our heads around some of the, the harder numbers that we can't do just verbally. But um, thank you all for, for sharing this information. We all know that this is this next step is, is um, crucial and getting it right is um, not gonna be the easiest task in the world. So um, thank you everybody and we will see you next time.